Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to Radio Ramadan. So Radio Ramadan, as you know, is broadcasting live from the UK. And we're very, very pleased that they have given us this opportunity again. So welcome to Hot Topics. Hot Topics today, uh, we're going to do business talks live from London and with my guest from Glasgow. So Ramadan Radio 87.9 FM. We're also live on Facebook and YouTube and other media platforms. Do call in if you have any questions. Yes, 77 614 So Radio Ramadan, broadcasting from London and Glasgow. We have a fantastic guest for you. Yes, and I mean fantastic. And the reason I say we have a fantastic guest is he started from humble beginnings and is self-taught and educated. So, you know, that, that's it. So my guest and expert today is Khalid Javed Saab from Scotland. Assalamu alaikum, Khalid Javed Saab. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Dunkin? Alhamdulillah. Oh, it's uh, been a long time. Always a pleasure to meet up with you and see you. I think we were met, met last, uh, last year or just before the pandemic, I think, at uh, an event in London. Uh, award ceremony, I think, and uh, mashallah. Mm. So Khalid Javed Saab is an entrepreneur. He's a businessman. He's a business advisor. He is in local politics and in Pakistan politics. And as I say, he started from humble beginnings. He self-educated himself. He worked very, very hard. Yes. And Marshall today, he is very well known in Scotland, Glasgow, especially. He's a mover and shaker, an influencer, influencer, influencer and celebrity. Am I right with that? Um, that's my reading of you, Khalid Javed Saab? I think you are right. And uh, I, I think you are nice in uh, paying more, uh, giving more weight to the celebrity element of it. <laughs> No, no, I, I, Alhamdulillah, I, everyone knows you in uh, Glasgow, and I'll tell you why. May I? Please. It's something with uh, the color red on four wheels. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My so everywhere you go, people know where you are, and I get the reports as well, mashallah, of where you are and where you've been, or shall I say, where your vehicle is. Where my vehicle is, yeah. Let me share something about you regarding the color red. It was not so long ago that I was in London and I was talking to a, a business person. And while they were talking to me, they said that the London economy is booming and Scotland is not so much. Oh. And I said, okay, and I listened to him. And uh, then I said to him, could you please tell me what's the biggest currency that you have in, in London? Yes. And he immediately pulled out a red 50 pound note. Oh. He said, that's the biggest we have. Well, being Scottish, I couldn't stop there. I put my hand in my pocket and Tamkin Bai, I pulled out a red hundred pound note. His, his eyes opened up. He said, what's that? I said, this is the highest currency we have in Scotland. We have a hundred pound note with the highest currency while England only has a 50 pound note. So you see the redness, the hundred pound, the 50 pound. So I still believe that Scotland is still economically a, a lot better off. We have a hundred pound note, and uh, you guys down in England only have a fifty pound note. Both well, are... well, I'll come and see you, and you can give me all your hundred pound notes. Not a problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, not only that, Scotland actually is much much richer than the UK and England because you've got the oil. And believe it or not, if you don't know, I know, and you know that the most A levels and highly educated students are Scottish. Compared to England, they have the highest achieving A-level results as well. And uh, Scotland takes education very, very seriously. Yes, Alhamdulillah, we, we, we have a number of uh, uh, universities here. And uh, be it though, the Glasgow, is one of the, Glasgow University is one of the most popular ones. But you will know that uh, uh, Prince Charles's son actually studied at St Andrews, which is also yes. uh, in, in, in Scotland. That's right. Yes. No, Scotland has uh, produced a lot of lot of scientists and mathematicians and computer experts. And of course, now they have you, Khalid Javed Saab. Incidentally, you know, I last time I met one of my friends, 
at the Bank of England. Um, okay. And while I was there, and I said, well, you, the Bank of England was really a brainchild of a Scottish individual. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. My yeah. God. Yeah, it was, it was a Scottish individual who, who thought of that. And, and let me share something else with you for some of our listeners. You, you will, of course, have heard the name Lipton Tea. Yes. Lipton Tea is all over the world. And I remember as, as a young boy in Pakistan, in Karachi, that it had to be Lipton's, uh, Lipton's Chai, they used to call it. And you used to see the advert in television and everything. Well, lo and behold, uh, the, the, the element of Lipton Tea was a Scottish person. Oh. Scotland, Scotland who, who, who sailed and then he went to, I think one of the first places he went to was, uh, at that time it was called Ceylon, now it's called Sri Lanka, and, and they developed from there, and the element of tea going worldwide, and although Lipton tea is not so much available in, in Scotland, I don't know about England, but certainly in the subcontinent, when you go into places like Pakistan, India, uh, Lipton tea is still the number one. Again, that, that was a Scottish individual. You will also know that Scotland also, uh, we were blessed with uh, Andrew Carnegie, who at a young age left uh, the Broomy Law uh, in, in my hometown in Glasgow, sailed to America and, and made his fortune over there. And yes, Scotland does have a, a, a number of individuals who have <clears throat> excelled scientifically, financially, uh, be it so, it's not so much now, but I think the element of developing oneself, developing one business is more now than ever before. Absolutely, and especially about with the lockdown. Now, I just want to move backwards slightly, if I may. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you worked hard and the types of jobs you did and where you are now? Reason being, I think it's very important to inspire and educate people. And those who think that they, because of their social upbringing and their social uh, hierarchy that maybe they are not able to do and achieve what you have done. So if you don't mind, sir, I know, but please tell our viewers and listeners. Okay, let's find a way. Um, I, I, my, my father came here in the early 60s, which a lot of other people's fathers did as well. Uh, they, they came here in search of not a better life, but I presume at that stage in time, they wanted to maybe gather a little bit of money and then return back to wherever they came from, whether it be India or Pakistan. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and then maybe start some business over there, etc. My, my father came here uh, on a, a, a shipping line called Anchor Line Shipping, which sailed, as I far remember, it, it went from New Zealand, Australia, etc., came into India, and they were taking raw materials from these countries and coming into the Lancashire mills uh, in England, and then turning that into cloth. Uh, so my father came aboard one of those ships, and he remember telling me that it took 21 days uh, via Lemosol, the Suez Canal, to come into Liverpool. And in those 21 days, they could not phone back home, or write a letter. Oh, so it wasn't a case of you 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 leaving that Karachi airport or anywhere and getting into certain docks and then phoning home back. Back home, there was no phones. But my dad said it was a very, very, how can you say, a, a very, very difficult journey. And with the ship going up and down, and my father had never sailed on these ships before, he, he, he felt sick many, many times. And I remember him sharing with me that uh, when people left uh, Pakistan to come to England, everybody sent something with them. Could you take this parcel for my son, my, my brother or whatever? And I remember on, on one, one of the, the, the occasion that my father came, somebody actually gave him a pickle, mango pickle. Oh. Because, yeah, it wasn't readily available in UK. They said, can you take this mango pickle for such, such a person? My father did. And my father told me that because the ship was going up and down and he was feeling sick and everything, he actually opened up the jar of pickle. <laughs> and, and he had some of that pickle, which sort of soothed his stomach and he didn't vomit so much. Uh, I don't know if at the other end the person received the whole uh, pickle or not, but that was that was a humble beginnings. Mashallah. Yeah, we followed uh, some years later. Uh, my mother and my two sisters. We followed from there. Originally, we had settled in Manchester in an area called Longsight, and uh, from there, my father was working in a mill. And there used to be a newspaper, uh, open newspaper, 
called Mashrik. Mashrik. And in that newspaper, it had advertised that in Glasgow, bus drivers were required. And when my father seen this advert, he traveled here to Glasgow, he sat the driving test for the buses, passed, and then came back and took us uh, to Glasgow. And that was in the early 65s. So since then, we've been in Glasgow all that time. Now, academically, myself, I was a very brilliant student at school. And I presume that we have a lot of listeners who may be in the same position that academically you're never good at school. And the system, the system itself fails you. They said, you're not a bright lad or you're not a bright person and they fail you. And I remember uh, going on to secondary school. Now, Tomkin, in a class of 30, when you sat your exams and they added up all the marks that you got, and then you were put in a hierarchy of where you were in that class. Yes. In my class, uh, in a class of 30 in first year, during the Christmas exams, I came number 28. Oh. So the first year bottom class, and I was right at the bottom. But I do not know if the other two people who were below me, whether they did or did not turn up for their exams. <laughs> if they didn't, it, it was last. <laughs> now, in those days, uh, we had what was called report cards. You took these report cards home and you showed it to your parents. Uh, I couldn't understand what 28 meant, but I showed it to my father, who was not very, very impressed. So he sort of self-educated me by not going out to play, by studying. And by the time summer came around, in the same class, I sat the summer exams and I came fourth in that class. In mashallah, mashallah. So a wee bit of attention to detail it can take you miles apart. And then when we went into second year, I came in one of the top classes of second year. In that class, again, the exams happened. I was 18th at this Christmas exam. Father didn't like it. Again, stopped going outside and playing. He educated as much as possible. And then the same year, I was again fourth in that second year class. So Gosh. that sort of excelled my way to go on and to get a chance to set some O levels, which I normally wouldn't have. Because in those years, uh, what Scotland had, I don't know if England had it or not, but we had what was then called the three R's. The three R's meant writing, reading, and arithmetic. That's what they geared you up for, that you, you knew how to write, you knew how to read, and you knew how to subtract and add. Once you knew that, you were out of school. Not much of a chance of a career. So as I went along and I, I sat my exams and did well, I could not get onto university, Tamkin, because I wasn't, how could I say, not bright enough. And I suppose there's a lot of youngsters listening to this and they will be thinking the same. Well, I wasn't bright enough to go to university. So I ended up doing this and that and the next. For my situation in, in Scotland, in Glasgow, my home city, there wasn't anything else but restaurants and takeaways. There were no mills here or anything like that. There was no chances of apprenticeships, et cetera. So I ended up working in a restaurant. And I remember Tamkin, my first job was washing dishes in a kitchen. Today we call them kitchen technicians. In those days, we were known as dishwashers. <laughs> and yes, we have great names now. And I remember I had to start my work at five o'clock in the evening and work until two o'clock in the morning oh. for three pounds. Three pounds? For three pounds a night. Wow. Now we're talking about the 1975, 70, 75 thereabouts. There was no such thing as a national minimum wage. There was no such thing as health and safety, etc. You just did what you were told and you got your three pound and you went home. So those were the early beginnings. And once I was working along this and studying at the same time, so I ended up leaving school, but I managed to get an apprenticeship at Governor Shipbuilders as an electrical engineer. So worked there for a number of years, left there, came back and started working in restaurants again. There was no other option. Now, the turn for me came that one day I went shopping for a pair of black trousers. In those days, all the waiters had was a black trouser, a white shirt and a bow tie. Now, when I went into a store that was called C&A's, 
I don't know if the listeners may be heard of this. But Canada, it's... Canada, C and A. Yes, I remember. Yeah, yeah. It's closed down now. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's still in Europe. Is still there, but not in UK. Mm. And I actually always wonder what what the C and A meant. I thought it meant maybe two partners, but when I did some research in later years, it meant child and adolescents. Mm. So C and A, child and adolescents. Now, Timki, when I went in to buy a pair of trousers, and I could not see the one I wanted. I asked one of the assistants to help me and guide me in buying a pair of bell-bottom trousers. Oh, I think yeah. you're a little bit too young to remember that, Tim King. No, no, 76, 74, 76, I had bell-bottoms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so these were bell-bottom trousers that were very, very wide at the, at the ankles. Yeah. And the lady in the shop said, I'm sorry, sir, we don't have them. In fact, we've not stocked them for over three years. Oh. I said, are they out of fashion? She said, yes. Now, when I went back home and I went, God, I've been working in a restaurant and fashion has gone past and I didn't even know that. So I made up my mind. I'm going back to further education yeah, as a mature student and I'm going to study. And that's exactly what I did. I went back and studied. Now, when you've been through life and you've had your ups and downs, you appreciate education a lot more th than normally. And if there's any listeners out there of thinking that they've had enough whatever job or career they're in, I suggest to them humbly, seek further education. In fact, during this pandemic situation that we've had, a open university has had a surge of people doing courses on open university to, uh, to get further education and get better at what they're doing. Now, education took me a long way, ended up getting a job as an accountant. I worked in a, in a firm for a number of years and then decided to open my own practice. Sure. Now, we're coming into 1999. So I opened up my own practice and I prayed to God that whatever happens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least put 50 pounds in my hand. 50 pounds so I can put some fuel in my car and go back and forward to work. So this all started and 1997 kicked in. Seven years I've been doing accountancy and Tim King, it wasn't working for me. Wow. Yeah, it wasn't working for me. And I'll tell you why it wasn't working for me. Because I had confused which a lot of people do, that being a businessman and being an accountant were the same thing when they're not. Being a businessman is totally different and being an accountant is totally different. So in 1997, I joined the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce and I suggest that those people who are in business, that they, they develop some links with any sort of organization or agency and network with them. When you're networking, you're out there talking to a lot of people, going to a lot of events and discussing a lot of things and what that does is it actually, what's the word I'm using? It actually empowers you with a little bit of more education, a little bit of more things to do, and you can do better. So the year was 1997, I started this. And Tim Keen, it took me four years to 2001, sorry, sorry, 1997 to 2001 to start doing a little better. When 2001 came in, you remember, Tim Keen, the new S-Class came out, Mercedes-Benz? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, I bought that cash in, in uh, 2001. MashaAllah. Yeah, I, I had a second hand. I had a second hand one, uh, yeah. 1971. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why it worked for me. I, while doing my research, and I was praying to God to show me the way to get better at my business, uh, I started reading the Quran in English so I can understand what it says. And one of the best in the Quran, it says that those people who deal in interest they are waging war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. War against the creator. And those people who are involved in this, uh, I suggest that you get away from this. Why? Because you cannot win against God. God is ultimate. God knows what he's doing. And you cannot wage war against him. You, you're going to lose. So I didn't get involved in interest. Things got better for me. 2001 came in. And year after year, things got better and better. Uh, I bought a, I had a passion for classic cars. Education was good. Clientele was coming in and I made a lot of friends through my networking events, etc. And business excelled and got better and better. And here we are now at 2021. And Alhamdulillah, uh, now, now I'm thinking of not retiring, but finding a new venture that maybe I want to do. I'm not saying that I've had enough of accountancy, but I think I've developed enough academic knowledge and scope and experience to maybe try my hand at something new. MashaAllah. 
So this has actually impressed me and I'm sure it's impressed the listeners and other viewers on Facebook and on YouTube that you can get. And Marsha, you are now from a Mercedes to a Rolls Royce sir, convertible. Yes, yes, yes. Well, they don't call it convertible. They call it a drop head. Drop head? Yeah, they call it a drop head. Oh, and okay. it's the Rolls Royce Phantom drop head. Uh, uh, one of the heaviest cars available out there. Uh, which they've stopped making now because they said a lot of people weren't buying them. Well, I thought of selling it, and I thought, no, I presume it will go up in price. Well, if they've stopped, uh, it'll be a limited edition, and in edition. 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you can pass it on to me when you're fed up with it. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I've <laughs> had that offer from a number of people, Tamkin. One of the advantages <laughs> of having a, a, a car of that size is that if you park somewhere, you're only going to get a ticket your car is not going to be towed away. Ah. Because they don't have the equipment to lift that car up. Mashallah. That's one of, that's one of the advantages. Uh, I'll tell you what, it cost me £60 to £80 to park in London. So I could park and get a ticket for £60. It'd be cheaper for me. <laughs> for cheaper. And you could park there all day. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. So it's very inspiring, Khalid Javed. So I really appreciate it. So now you've told us your background and business. So now I'm going to grill you a little bit. Is that okay, sir? Yes, please do. Please do. Yeah. So you're an entrepreneur. I will call you an entrepreneur, not an accountant, because you've explained that there's a difference between doing a job and being a business person. So how do you, or how did you get your targets? How did you grow? How did you achieve your targets? You know, define targets for our listeners and viewers. I think target means a lot of people, a lot of things to a lot of people. Mm. I, I personally don't want to call it a target. It means you're aiming at something. I would rather suggest a goal. A goal, and a goal only happens, uh, Tim Kimbai, if you have a dream. Uh -huh. If you don't have a dream, you'll never get a goal. There's a lot of people, especially youngsters now, that they, 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 they would like to do something, but they don't dream enough about it. They don't have enough passion within themselves. Uh, and you know why that is? They're too busy on the phone and computer games. Yes, yes. That Well, okay. Uh, let me share something with you regarding that. Uh, yesterday, uh, you know, this is Ramadan and we've got a lot of time on our hand reading the Quran and doing your namaz and everything, Salat. I, I went into look at a business and when I said to you that I'm looking at a new business to go into and I noted that everybody regardless if you're a man or a woman young or old regardless of what ethnicity you belong to everybody wants a wee bit of celebritize they want to celebritize them they want to be a celebrity and I thought that within my community there's not enough of that there's not enough of being a celebrity so could you imagine if if we ran courses and events where people will know how and what to do to become a celebrity. Very good. Very I good. think that's the next thing that I, I, I would like to do. And being a celebrity doesn't automatically mean you're famous. Being a celebrity actually means that you're going to do something different to what you were doing. And when you said, you know, you talk about targets and I spoke about goals, mm -hmm. that's what it means to do something different that nobody else is doing. Uh, one of the things I'd like to share with you is that we have a very, very big, a very, very big business in the world called Coca-Cola. Yes. And then we have another nice business in Thornton Heath called Tanduri Corner. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Now, they're both in business. And then sometimes I think, why is one on a hierarchy up there and the other one is not so? And I think the reason behind this is not, you know, in the first year that Coca-Cola came on the market, they only sold 25 bottles in the whole year. 25, wow. 25 bottles in the whole year. And then, and I remember the, their drink used to be in a, I, I wouldn't say a can, but it was a, a, a metal sort of tube. And then they came up with a bottle design where the product could be easily recognized. Now, when you have all these bottles of soft drinks everywhere, Coca-Cola stands out because it's shaped like a lady's body. Yes, yes. The body stands out. So th there's an element here that when people are in business here, yeah, 
when people are in business, they always look at the other person's wallet of how much money we can get out of them. I suggest that those people who think like that, stop. Stop thinking about what you can get out of somebody's pocket. But in fact, if you've got a business or a service, think about getting in that person's heart. When you get into that person's heart, you create what's called loyalty. And when you create loyalty, it means you've created a customer for life. And that's what Coca-Cola have done. They've created a customer for life. No matter where you are in the world, you will buy that product again and again. And I presume to a certain extent, that's what business growth means. That's what your goals mean. That's what your targets mean. That's what your aims mean. So not only are you looking for new clients, prospective clients, but you're taking care of your current clients that they're going to buy you from again and again. And the reason I shared this with you regarding Tanduri Corner, you know, some, some time back, you and I sat there for a meal not so long ago. Yes, and, yes. and I remember that his particular uh, eatery was nicely displayed. It was nicely displayed, one of the nicest displays I've ever seen. And it was the first time that I'd seen anywhere uh, in UK where you could buy a meal hot or cold. You could take it cold and eat it in the house, or you can pay for it here. And that was a very, very nice thing for them to do. By buying it cold, sorry, by buying it hot, you would pay VAT. That's on right. The, but by buying it cold and eating it in the house, you don't pay VAT. So you've got a cheaper uh, uh, food pack that you can go and heat in the house. That was excellent. That was an excellent way uh, of them making their customers loyal. You don't have to wait. Sometimes you go into a, a takeaway at a restaurant, you have to wait for your meal to get warm, to set the temperature and go on. But that was a very nice thing that Kanduri Corner did in Thornton Heat in, in Croydon. So, That's right. Yes, so he had hundreds and hundreds menu. And I kept saying to you, your menu is too large. Reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. He said, no, my clientele want the choice. There'll be always something for them. And there was a lot of wastage because he used to make so much. But the wastage, what he used to do with the wastage, at 10 o'clock, whatever was left, he, he closed at midnight. From 10 to 12, everything half price. So that was the way he did it. No, and I'm, so it helped a lot of people half price after 10 o'clock. I see, I see a lot of restaurants and, uh, and takeaways. When you yes. look at their, uh, their menu, it looks like Britannia Encyclopedia. Yes. You've got so many dishes. And yes. yet, when you look at some of, the, some of the other takeaways, they only have a handful. Yes. Uh, and I'm of the opinion that we should create not a big menu, but a valuable menu that your dishes are the best. And you, you won't need so much stock to carry about that you've got to do this. And I mean, the classic example is maybe to use is McDonald's. McDonald's yes. have so many burgers and NASA. But every now and then, to keep up with their client loyalty, they bring out a special limited edition only available for, for so many weeks. Yes. So there's nothing wrong in, in uh, 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 the business is developing into that. Yes, very good. So, so let's talk about adding value uh, in the business and trust. So I think you know, you've, you've touched on that, adding value and trust in a business and to keep it going and to keep up with what's going on with the trends and what the customer wants. Yes, yes, Tim King, you're right there. But I believe that keeping up with the trends and keeping up with the customer wants and product modification or services modification requires a, what's the word I'm looking for? It requires what we in the business called mindset. mindset. And if you don't have that mindset of, of catering for you, your clientele, whether it be a restaurant or an accountancy practice, if you don't have that mindset that you want to keep the clientele loyal to you, you, it will be very, very difficult, not impossible, but very, very difficult to build up your business to the next stage. You, you've got to have that mindset that, that people will trust your product and services. It creates a goodwill, and it means that your business can go on functioning for a lot longer and a lot healthier. Yes, yes, you're right. So why are business relationships important? And not to leave your business relationship and your customers on the back burner to cool down or get cold. You must always have your customer and business at your forefront. Yes, because well, your customer is the person who's going to exchange the goods and services for a set of price of money. 
So you've got to understand your customer. And it's very, very important that you understand your customer, what he wants, when he wants it, and how you're going to serve it. You know, it's, it's, it's what's maybe called uh, customer relationship management, CRM, where you, you would try and find out what your customer really wants, when does he want it, and how much he wants to pay for it. These, these things are very, very important. Recent survey that was carried out some time back suggested that if you have loyalty uh, from your, your clientele, 51% of your revenue comes from your loyal customers. The passing trade is all very good, but if you've got a person walking in your door and buying something, you've got to understand why he's buying it, when he's going to buy more. You've created a database and, and you will know that, well, the youngsters will know that every time you go on to buy something on the internet just now, you put your name, your address, and you put your, you, you put your email on it. From time to time, that particular company will fire you back with emails of goods and services that they've got. Uh, not just that, the, the, you will find out that Facebook itself, every time you visit a particular page, Facebook keeps a track of that. If, for example, I'm looking for a T-shirt, and I've looked at a t-shirt, somehow their logarithms uh, develop that this chap is always looking at t-shirts. They will send more t-shirt adverts your way uh, and creating loyalty and turning that into a financial revenue, which, which is very, very good. And I think that's the way forward for, for most of businesses to move forward. You've got to create, you've got to create that client loyalty. When somebody buys from you once, don't just divorce it as a one-off sale. Find out about your customer. Find out why, why he wanted this, why that particular color. In fact, let me share this with you, uh, Tumkin. Uh, when I was down London visiting to you one of these uh, times, I, 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 went into, I, I went into a Bulgari shop. They had opened up their flagship store in Knightsbridge. And they, used to sell, they sold clothing there, which I wasn't so much interested in. But they sent me to one of the timepieces shops in uh, Mount, Mount Street, uh, not so far away from Knightsbridge. And when I went, the usual, you go in, you got to press a, a bell before you get in, you go in, they offer you tea and coffee. And rather than sell me a watch, they started asking about myself, of what mm -hmm. I did, etc. And within about, I, I must have said maybe 30, 40 minutes, the gentleman in the shop said, we have not got the watch that you want. Now no. he had he had so many watches in the shop, oh. but he said, we haven't got the watch that you want. But he said, I know what you want, and I've searched it. It's in Milan, and I can get it here for you for next month. Now, those Bulgari watches aren't cheap, Tankin. They're not cheap. I know. I know. You know? So I, I walked away from the shop, and I said, thank God I didn't. He didn't show me anything because <laughs> I would have to buy something. It's <laughs> embarrassing taking up somebody's time and not buying anything. But, you know, a month later... He phoned me. He said, we've got the watch for you. So the next time I was down in London, I, I took the advantage of going into the shop. And he was right. He brought me out a watch with an orange dial. Now, orange mm -hmm. is one of my favorite colors. Mm -hmm. How did he know this? Yes, yes. So by yes. talking to me and understanding me psychologically, and, and he showed me the watch. And the watch was, when you wear it on your hand, you've got a, you've got a face on the front. But on the side here, it had another it had another rectangular face, which meant that Bulgari, when you're driving a car, you don't need to turn your whole hand to look at your watch. You can just look at the side here and you will get the time told. So yeah, it was great. But you know how much he wanted for it? He wanted 250,000 pounds. <laughs> so I'm keen. I kid you not. I had to find a way of getting out of that shop. <laughs> and and I did. I managed to. I managed to get out of it, but a month later, Duncan, he phoned me again. Yes. And he invited me to a picture gallery. Oh. And I said, listen, I'm not interested. I can't buy a watch for 250000 I don't see the point of buying a, a, a painting for a million quid or whatever it may be. But no, no, he said, come down. So I went down there and he took me to the gallery. And while we were going to the gallery, he said, Khaled, I don't want you to buy anything there. Huh? I said, why are you taking me there then? He said, I want you to meet the people who buy these paintings. Wow. And I said, yes, got you now, got you now. He yes. said, if you meet these millionaires and these billionaires, and if you could do some business with them, that would be good. Now, 
to me, and then you can buy the watch. <laughs> then I can buy the watch. Yeah. <laughs> to me, to me, Tamkin, that particular gentleman yeah. understood exactly where I was, yes. and did he create loyalty? Yes, he did, because he took the time to find out about me and not just stop if I didn't buy anything, but in fact he went on further to help me. And I think, I think the business you've got to have that. You've got to have that loyalty. Don't sell something to somebody once. You know, give it to him in a way that he's going to come back to your shop. In yes. fact, I'll share another experience with you regarding this. Uh, you, you know that every time I come down to London, I've got to have an outfit that makes a statement. And a hanky, and a hanky. You have to buy a yeah, hanky to yeah, go with and, it. And a, well, we call them pocket squares in Scotland. Pocket squares, right. You, you chaps <laughs> in England call them hankies, which yeah. we put uh, on our side pockets. So the, the pocket square is only there for our decoration. That's right. Yeah, so now in Scotland, they don't sell so much of the uh, ethnic suits and attire here. But when I was in London, sorry, in Birmingham, so I walked into this uh, Sadarji shop and I looked about and everything. And eventually I found something that I liked. And he gave me the price of, of the suit and the trousers and everything. I said, Sadarji, I don't want the trousers. Just sell me the top. So I, I think I must have spent about an hour choosing what I wanted. He sold me the top that I wanted at the price that I wanted. Oh, and while sure. I was going to leave the shop, I said to him, listen, that pair of trousers is no use to you now because I bought the top. Why don't you throw that in as well? <laughs> I'm, I'm a Scotsman. I'm looking for a bargain. And that's what exactly he did. He gave me the trousers as well. But before I left the shop, he said to me, he said, Mr. Callard, if you ever come down to Birmingham again, please visit my shop again. And you know, that's where I get my all my efforts now. On so, in the, so there's a loyalty coming in. You yes. know, if people, if they take the time to understand what you want, they, they will all appreciate it. He, he gave you added value and extra. Uh, extra, see? yeah. yeah. yeah I, that's I what think that he made a loss out of the suit that I bought. But what he did potentially do is he took he took the benefit out of earning from me again and again and again. Yes. Not just a one-off. Very good. So uh, another short question for you. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got so many questions for you, but, um, you know, we are, we are delving deep, which is good. We are telling people the story, you know, not, not yes, no answers, do this, do this. So I think they will find it very educational. So talking about education, you've got to keep updating yourself with the knowledge, develop your skills. So business does help develop yourself and skills, doesn't it? If you are attuned to it. I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, you will remember many, many years ago when cars first came out, uh, they weren't electronic ignition or anything. Mm -hmm. You had this sort of wheel brace that you had at the front of the car and you swung it around a couple of times. Yes. And, and when the starter car- motor, Get the starter motor going. Yes. Got the starter motor going. And then, of course, the, the development came in with the key and now it's finger touch buttons, etc. So the element of development is very, very important, mm -hmm. not only for your product and your services, but you as an individual. You mm -hmm. as an individual have to develop yourself, not only in education, the way you dress, the way you... You know, there are courses out there that help you how to talk, how to stand up, how to, how to do things, you know. And occasionally, when I do watch some of your programs, Tamkin... I learned a lot from sometimes how you handle a conversation. And I think this element of learning is that nobody, nobody's born with these qualities. We all have to go out there and learn something from somewhere. You know, I again, we're back in Birmingham. I, I, I met some people who were into poetry. Uh, I think one of our mutual friends, Irfan Bhatt from Birmingham. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sir. I interviewed him a couple of weeks back. Yes. Oh, mashallah. And, and he, he's a... He's a poet, he's a learned man, and he used to do this poetry. And But his poetry for me was very, very deep. It was Ghalid Mirza, et cetera, you know, and it just sort of flew past me. But I developed I, I, I developed a, a liking for poetry, you know, and- I and, do get your poetry now and again, sir. You do get, I do get it. So these, uh, so what, what I do there is, you know, the development acts, whatever I dream of night, I try and make up something with words in the morning. Uh -huh. in the morning, I share that with some of my friends like yeah. yourself. 
So the element of development is very, very important. You will find out that in everything, in any business that anybody does, there's always a development stage. And I think the best people who are doing it just now are the people who sell you mobile phones. Mm. Sell your mobile phone, you've bought it, you've just got to, you've just found out how it all works before you find out there's a new one on the market. Yes, yes, you know? yes. So, so you, you can't just sell a product or service to somebody once, but it's a, it's a continual development process in everything we do. I mean, years ago, you know, we're talking about development process. Let me go back on to catering. If you wanted a paratha, you had to make sure there was water available, atta was available, and then you had to have the will and the strength to do that. Now all you have to do is go to a shop and buy a frozen one and heat it up in a couple of minutes. So the development stage is, is very, very important to everything that we do in our life. And for the youngsters, the development stage is education. In whatever you do, make sure that whatever you do, at least you've got education with you. Once you've got that education, you can go a lot, a lot of places. Uh, and those people who maybe not have the education, but they have the experience of, of going further and further, they're, they're very well developed as well. If you look at Microsoft, I think, the story goes that when Bill Gates went to somebody to launch his Windows-based uh, equipment, they turned him down. And look where he is now. So never give up, but always continually develop yourself, your product and your services in whatever you do. Uh, very good. Education, as you know, and I know, you know, is so easy nowadays. Online, you can go into Google, you can Google what you want, and you can teach yourself and you do online courses. Now, since the pandemic, last March, I have taken seven or eight online courses as well as doing. So I'm always, and as you know, I'm in education as well. I've been in education since 1980 and I'm still in education and I'm actually in Croydon College at the moment, you know, helping there a few days a week, a few hours. So, so I took some courses as well. So you've got to constantly develop yourself. And the courses now online are affordable, very, very affordable for everyone. So there's a mass market out there. And on WhatsApp and whatever, I'm in some groups, people ask me, which courses have you done? Where did you do them? And when I send them the link, they come back to me a few weeks, a few months later and say, thank you very much. We did that course. We learned so much. We appreciate it for your help. So, you know, it's giving. So I think education, you have to improve yourself where it's weekly, monthly, yearly. You've got to keep up the trends. So thank you for that. So, right. So people say, you know, you have to think outside the box. Yeah. But there is no box. It's the limitation in your mind, isn't it? So what, what do you think about, you know, thinking outside the box and the concepts of being creative and trying out new concepts and techniques and tactics for your business? I think that's a very good question you've asked me. And I think to think outside the box, as you say, to be creative, mm. it cannot happen if you don't have the passion within yourself. Yes. Passion is very, very important to whatever you want to do. If you have the passion, you will find out that it'll take you miles and miles ahead. And one of the examples, the best example I can give you is now, uh, Tamkin, who's that racing driver? Uh, that's doing very well just now. I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you. Ben. I'm I not think he, was, he was knighted recently as well. He got no. the title of Sir. Sir Lewis Hamilton. Oh, Hamilton, right. I've heard the name. Yes. Yeah. So if you read his story, he used to do go karting when he was a younger lad. Oh. And now, if you and I did go karting, we'd get a slap on the wrist. Yes. They, they would, the parents would say to us, no, go to university. What's this go karting all about? Well, he kept up his go-karting, et cetera. And now he's in the Formula One race driver. And every time you, you go on to these racing, all you hear is, is there's no something going up and it's going to, you always hear this. So whatever you have, whatever passion you have, develop it. Whether it be cooking, counting, accountancy, finance, you know, broadcasting, being an actor, whatever you've got, develop that passion and take it further. Don't think of your passion as just a dream. Think of it as a goal that you're going to achieve. Think of it as a target that you suggested that you're going to achieve and you're going to take this forward. And always, always network with organizations, people. Mm -hmm. and you just never know where your next 
situation. Now, years ago, Tamkin, to find you would, would have been impossible. What do I do? How do I make friends with you? You know, do I look up the direct inquiries? It would have been totally, totally impossible. And I think you and I developed a friendship over Facebook. Yes. A number of years ago. So yeah. as, as society moves on, we've got a lot, a lot at our disposal. You know, even talking today, there are you in London, here am I in Glasgow, and people all over the world are listening to us. Not and sure. this would have been not possible so many years ago. So yeah. the technology is there as long as you have the passion to drive this forward, which is where, and, and the passion doesn't just come to you overnight. You, you've got to read periodicals, you've got to read magazines, you've got to go to events, you've got to go to listen to people of what they say. And it's a continuing learning process. And as long as you have that in your life to continue to learn, if you ask a youngster now, I've met a lot of 12 year olds, they know more about cars than I do. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had a passion for cars, but yeah. they know a lot about it than I do. If I, in my office, if I want to buy some new uh, computer or, or, or program, I can't do it, but I've got people there who are passionate about this. So I link up with them talk to them and develop it further. So that's why it's very, very important that you have that, uh, the continually professional learning that you want to do in whatever field it may be, you, you know, and take that forward. But you must awaken that passion that you have inside you that I want to do this, that I want to achieve this. Never, never. I've seen some youngsters that say, oh, this is not for me and I can't do it. And you know, you, you feel like shaking them a little bit and say, no, you can. And I wish... And I wish that the length of breadth of this country, and I hope there are some educationists, and I hope there are some MPs and politicians listening out there, that we have not only colleges and universities, but we have an academy for business people where people can go and learn, that people can go and learn about, about business. In fact, you know, if you want to buy a dog, you've got to have a license. If you want to get married, you've got to have a license. If you want to drive a car, you've got to have a license. Why not, if you want to have a business, you've got to have a license. Why not give somebody three months of to go learn a little about business where people like academics like yourself can maybe guide them and instruct them a little bit to awaken that passion inside and help them all the way through. Thank you for that. Yes, um, uh, a lot of my friends, they do um, guide people and, and help people with their planning. You know, some of them have a hobby, uh, which they're good at, but in their job, they're not so good. So we then say to them, right, let's have a look at your hobby. You understand it. You know it. You know, how can we turn your hobby into a business? Now, make sure that you, a business, you have to make money. Yeah. At the end of the day, a hobby, you are spending all the time. You're not necessarily making money. So you have to then put your business hat on, isn't it? So there is a slight difference. So we need to train people that want to go forward and want to maybe turn their hobby into a business, you, I, and other people can guide them, you know, at no expense. We're not going to charge, you know, uh, we, it's a sadga jaria. We, if we got the knowledge, yeah, when we die, what's going to happen to that knowledge? It's gone. Yeah, exactly. If we are able to help and progress others with that knowledge, mashallah, then the sadga jaria will help us, inshallah. So that, that's uh, what we should be doing, you know giving freely of our time where possible. Obviously, you know, people shouldn't take advantage, but, you know, we will give free. Yourself and others, like ourselves, we do do that. You know, yes. I spoke about an academy for business, but yes. even if you start off something, wherever it may be, people go to the mosque regularly, they go to the Gurdwara lesson, they go to the Mandir regularly. If we can take maybe an hour a week, yes, yes. just for youngsters or even elders to come in and discuss a little bit, that would be magnificent for, for our community to develop in there. And God knows where it could end up. You know, uh, university and colleges do it as well. But it, it would be real life examples from real life people rather than just having academics to, to telling you about it. I would rather spend some time with a business person who's, how can you say, have an Excel, Excel. I would rather talk to him rather than talk to an academic at university or something because he's only going to give me textbook information. Whereas the real world is completely, completely different. That's right. uh, academy just to guide you now you were talking about youngsters and if I tell you that we organized about three years ago in the local mosque for the elders to get online and they didn't have an email address 
So we taught them how to get an email address. And then we showed them what a mouse was, what a computer was, what a keyboard was. And now they're emailing me. They're going online, looking at Google, researching. And this is for the elders, you know. And Marshall, it took two or three lessons, two or three hours, or a, a, an hour a week. After three weeks, they knew had an email address. They could go into Google. They could search. And they were so, so happy, Marshall. We're talking about 60 plus and 70 and 80 year olds, mashallah. So you did, you did well there. It's fact, not only the youngsters. It's not only the youngsters. Yeah, you know, we see programs where yeah. people are taught how to cook. Yes. You know, two tablespoons of this and a pinch of salt or that. And, and it's fantastic that there's so much information available out there that you could develop yourself. But you, you got to have that passion inside you, a want inside you that I really, really want to do this and I want to take this to the next stage. So sure. all the people who are listening, and as Tamkin has said, that if you've got there, you want to change your life a little bit, or even you want to develop your life a little bit, then follow these rules of finding out where your data or your information is available. Link Excellent. up with community people and take it forward. It's amazing what you can achieve. You can go to your local library when possible or phone up or search Google or look at the college courses. We've only got a few moments left, you know, a few minutes left. Uh, there's a couple of more questions that I'd like to ask you if we've got some time. So, you know, you've got to keep up with your competition as well and in, find out what your competition is doing and see if you can do similar things. Keep an eye on the board and maybe improve what they're doing. And, you know, keep an eye out on your, what's happening in your sectors and what's happening around the world and improve. We've only literally got, you know, 90 seconds left. So if you can answer that quickly, then we'll uh, say uh, Allah Hafiz. Uh, competition is not only about you, the product or service yourself. Competition is about you looking better. And one of the best examples I can give you is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. Yes. When they went into movies, they were both, they said that was great. They were both competing against themselves to, to, to become uh, the best bodybuilders, et cetera. So yes, competition is a very, very good thing to developing yourself, whether you be in business or the movies, whatever, have that, have somebody as a, what word I'm a mentor, a mentor. a mentor, somebody that you can look up to say, I want to be good as him and then be better than him. And, and people do that all the time. The great Dilip Kumar actor and iconic of, of the silver screen, people are still copying him of how, how to act and how to do things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yes, a competition is very good. It keeps you awake, if nothing else, unless you know what's happening in the market. Marshall, good. So thank you very much for that insight. I wish we had more time because I've had so many questions that I wanted to ask you. Uh, obviously, you are a wealth of knowledge. And Marshall, we pass a little bit of knowledge on. If anyone needs any help, they can call um, Ramadan Radio. They will, uh, or, you know, text or WhatsApp on 077 614-60614, get in touch with myself or Harley Javed Saab. We'll be very pleased and happy to guide you where possible. So Jazakallah Khair, Khalid Javed Saab, I really appreciate you coming, uh, well, coming, being with us, giving us your time. And inshallah, we'll meet again soon when you're next in London, inshallah. And you've helped me as well uh, with some things I wanted to do in uh, uh, Scotland, which you um, uh, kindly very steered me away from doing that property I was going to look at. So, mashallah, you know, I, I, I didn't lose any money, alhamdulillah. So, Khalid Javisab, thank you very much to all our listeners and viewers on, on Ramadan Radio on Facebook and uh, YouTube and all the rest. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair, everyone. Wa alaikum as-salam. Wa alaikum as